This is our Sunday School lesson for May 7th, 2017 from our Faith Pathway Bible Study for Adults. This is Lesson 10 from our Unit 3, God's Pervasive and Sustaining Love. And our lesson's title for this Sunday is When Calamity Comes. Our devotional reading is Psalms. Number 139, verses 1 through 12. Our background scripture is the Jonah, chapter number 1. Our printed passage is Jonah, chapter number 1, verses 7 through 17. And our key verse is Jonah 1, verse 10. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? Our lesson's aims are to explore the nature of God's love in the story of Jonah, to sense how people feel when faced with calamity and how they respond when others think they have caused the calamity, and then to pray for assurance of the presence of God's love in the midst of calamity. Now, in addition to our lesson's aims, we also have a couple of citations here or observations uh, from the commentary, uh, which list four, and those are the peril of running away from God's calling, the danger of selfishness and practice of religious bigotry, the divine employment of imperfect man as channels of divine truth, and the all-inclusiveness of God's mercy. Now, our lesson is centered around a familiar story in the uh, collection of scripture from the Word of God, this one being from the book of Jonah. And um, in the secular world, the story of Jonah has been brought uh, about by different scholars as an allegory and uh, as a fable and such, but we are going to look into this lesson today and extract from it the rich pearls uh, that God has afforded us the opportunity to see in his commissioning of Jonah to do a special work for the Lord. Now, our verse uh, or our lesson starts at the seventh verse of the chapter number one of Jonah. Uh, this here is the beginning of the calamity. But prior to this, as we read from the beginning of the first chapter down to the seventh verse, we get a view into what caused this calamity that took place in the waters as the men were in the ship with Jonah. And so what we find is in the beginning, God commissioned Jonah to go into Nineveh. And he wanted Jonah to provide a specific assignment he wanted Jonah to preach his word of redemption and repentance to the people of Nineveh. But Jonah 
had another idea in mind. First of all, Jonah was not very favorable, or Jonah had a different attitude, a different disposition towards the people of Nineveh. And because of Jonah's condition or because of Jonah's hatred and dislike for the Gentile people of Nineveh, Jonah decided that he would go in an opposite direction. And the uh, word Tarshish, which is where Jonah decided to go with the men in this ship, uh, is referred to in scripture as a distant land. Now, it has been affixed that the actual location was in southern Spain. But uh, regardless to its actual geographical location, Jonah wanted to get far away from the assignment that God had placed upon him. And that is what brings us up to the reaction. It brings us up to how God dealt with Jonah's disobedience to what God commissioned him to do. And as we look at our lesson today, we need to ask ourselves, in what situations has God commissioned us to perform a certain work, to do a certain task, uh, to be uh, sent out uh, for the glory of God, and then we ourselves denied that. We ourselves decided that, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I don't like those people. I don't care for those people. Uh, I don't think that they're going to pay any attention to what I say. I don't want to waste my time there. Uh, they have a history of being reluctant and rebellious and such. And I don't want, I'm not, I'm not up to it. I'm just not going to do it. I don't feel it. Um, I don't want to tax myself that way. I'm going to go ahead and do something else. So when we look at Jonah, although our attention will be a foc uh, focused as to how Jonah responded to the assignment, let us also reflect on how we have responded to different assignments and to different charges that God has also given unto us. Now, our, our first section is highlighted. Disobedience brought a great storm in Jonah's life. And the key focus and emphasis there is disobedience. Uh, it wasn't... Uh, who Jonah was, it, it wasn't um, his ethnicity, it wasn't um, uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, vocation or his status or anything like that, but it was his disobedience that brought about the storm in his life. And so verses 7 through 15 explain to us how the sellers, how the mariners, the men on the ship, uh, how they encountered that something in their presence was wrong. Uh, although scripture doesn't tell us this, uh, we could assess to this that as the men began to uh, take this voyage, that they had probably already charted the weather conditions that they probably set out recognizing that the sea was favorable, uh, that there were no storms forecasted. But as they began to get out into the voyage, now they recognize they encounter a wild and raging storm. And they realize that this here is coming for some reason. 
Uh, and so then they began to check among themselves and they said to cast your lots. Now, the casting of lots is described through many different passages uh, in the Bible. Uh, but uh, so that we understand uh, what actually this practice of casting lots was. Uh, the casting of lots sometimes were sticks that had certain markings on them or stones with markings on them or there were other items with symbols on them and they would cast them into a small area and then interpret what the symbolism or what the markings on the stones were saying. And uh, it has been, in some commentaries, it's been uh, equated with uh, something that we may be f more familiar with today as the flipping of a coin, whether it's heads or tails. And sometimes when that is used, it determines the fate of what action is going to take place. So when these uh, lots were cast, they... Uh, fell upon Jonah. Now we must remember that Jonah had already gone to sleep uh, in the lower parts of the vessel of the ship. So that also sends us a certain message. And that is that even though don't Jonah, and, and I'll put us in here, even though we, Jonah, sometimes recognize that we are disobeying what God has asked us to do. But our reaction to it, the way we respond to it, doesn't display that we really are uh, at any, in any way affected by the fact that we're being disobedient. So Jonah, he was in the calm. Jonah was relaxing. He he knew he was going away from what he had been charged or commissioned to do, but he decided, I'm going to go ahead and just chill. I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to rest for a little bit. Uh, and so then they approach him and they begin to say, questioning him. They say, what kind of work do you do? Uh, where did you come from? What is your country? Uh, from what people are you? They wanted to get a background on who Jonah is, um, what he does, uh, where did he come from, because they know all of their backgrounds. Jonah's a stranger, and they want to know, uh, tell us something about yourself, because um, we cast our lots, which is a practice that you're familiar with, and it fell on you. So that lets us know that something about you is not correct. And therefore, Jonah began to explain, well, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the God of heaven, the one who made the sea and the dry land. And um, they said, well, what have you done? And he said, well, my Lord asked me to do something for him, and I decided I wasn't going to do it. So I'm running away from my Lord. And and uh, because he told me to do this thing, I said I wasn't. And um, once he made uh, that response, once he declared what he had done in rebellion to the Lord, the scripture says then that the sea got even wilder and rougher, that the intensity of the storm picked up, that the winds began to rage. And so... Isn't it something how when we identify what we have decided to do against what God has asked us to do, that sometimes the conditions we find ourselves in, they begin to intensify. Um, uh, instead of there uh, being somewhat of a same level of intensity, but once we identify that I'm aware. I know what God asked me to do, but I just decided I'm not going to do it. And all of a sudden, we notice that things seem to intensify. It is as though we have fueled the anger of God. And then 
Although we believe sometimes that my little self, you know, insignificant me, you know, uh, God not really affected or concerned about what my little insignificant self is doing. How could that affect a great God as God is? And how could little immaterial me affect anything that God wants to do? But when God has appointed us with his spirit to carry out his work, it's not about us, the individual person. It's about what God has put in us to complete and to accomplish his will. And so when we when we verbally acknowledge that, oh, yeah, I know this is what I'm supposed to do, but I just decided I'm not going to do it. So then we receive a signal. And so after this, the men inquire of him as to, well, what should we do? Uh, uh, how do we address this? And he said, well, just pick me up and throw me off the ship. Just pick me up and, and cast me out of here. And of course, the men are a little bit hesitant because they have already seen the presence of God being activated with the winds, the storm, and the very violent uh, waves of the water. So they know how powerful the God that Noah serves, serves is. So then they are hesitant because they don't want to add any more extra uh, due punishment upon them because they said, well, we don't want to be charged with casting this innocent man, although he's being disobedient to you, but we don't want to be charged with casting him over into the sea because we have seen what your Lord has done just by you running away. We don't want any more uh, punishment to be cast upon us. Uh, Jonah says, oh no, throw me over, throw me over the sea, and then uh, the, the Lord will remove this punishment that he is visiting upon me. He will remove it from you. And at the end of this, it says that after they cast Jonah overboard into the sea, that then the raging sea grew calm. Now let's think about that for a minute. All of this intensity and all of this great storm and the ship was being tossed to and fro and so much so that uh, they begin to cast off uh, cargo from the ship to try and lighten the load of the ship, hoping that that would, you know, kind of result in the ship balancing out and such. But they recognize that even though they had uh, collectively decided what they could do to make it a safer voyage, that after they had come together and agreed upon, hey, maybe we can do this, and maybe we can do that. That even af after they have exceeded their own intelligence and wit of how about what we can do to try to resolve this situation. Nothing happened until they removed the element that caused the disturbance. And once they removed the element that caused the disturbance, then the calm came. And what we can gather from that is, is sometimes even in our own personal relationships, sometimes with family members, uh, sometimes with our spouses, or uh, sometimes uh, with coworkers or what have you, that a lot of times, until we remove the element that is causing the disturbance, we can try to apply our own little remedies and our own little resolutions about how we're going to still make this work. We know we're not doing what the Lord would have us to do. We see all of the turbulence in our life. We recognize that the situation is not getting any better, but uh, we're going to go ahead and, and stay this course 
We're not going to do what God has asked us to do. We're going to do what we've decided to do. But once we realize that when we we remove these foreign elements, these decisions that we've decided to, uh, uh, to exercise on our own, when we remove our own self-worth and recognize that all of our worth is in the Lord, when we begin to apply what God has asked us to do, that's when the calm comes. When I'm angered with my spouse, when I choose to remove what I want to do to get vengeance, to, to win the argument, to have my own way. When I begin to do what the Lord has instructed us to do as engaged in relationships, uh, when I choose to exemplify love instead of hate, then I begin to recognize that the storm begins to subside. Uh, but as long as I choose to act upon my own will, then I, I recognize that the storm, it doesn't subside, but it, in, it begins to increase. The intensity builds up. So as we're looking at Jonah and, and assessing for ourselves, well, how come he didn't just do what the Lord said? Well, let's just ask ourselves in our own situations. How come we don't do just what the Lord says? Now, the larger part of our lesson uh, is focused on the end. It's focused on what happened when Jonah actually was spit up out of the fish that swallowed him and contained him for three days and three nights. We know that after the fish spit Jonah back up on dry land, that then Jonah went ahead with the assignment. But that's not what is focused on in our lesson. It's not the carry out in chapters 2, 3, and 4 as to how Nineveh actually did receive repentance. They did respond to the teaching of Jonah. But just as the word of God brought the Nineveh or the Ninevites back to the Lord, we look here at who was saved in this incident of the raging water, the storm. The men on the ship, they were saved because because of Jonah's disobedience they recognized the power of God they also recognized what disobedience to the true God what are the consequences of that they also recognized that the God of Jonah the Lord, the God of the sea and the dry land and the heavens. They also recognize that when you are in obedience, when you are in concert with God, that just as he sends the raging waters of the sea to get your attention, when we are obedient, he can also calm that raging sea. So the men on the ship, they recognize that the God that Jonah serves is the true God. Because after they recognized and saw what happened, the scripture tells us that then the men feared the God of Jonah and they, offer, they offered a sacrifice and, unto the God of Jonah and made vials. They made vows to the Lord. And so uh, when we look at, and those that are familiar with the story of Jonah know the outcome, but this lesson doesn't take us into the outcome. It takes us to the initial. It takes us to the beginning of the story. 
But even though salvation was offered in the end, salvation also was afforded to the men of the ship who had a upfront and personal uh, uh, experience with the God of Jonah. So as we close, we want to uh, look here at one very significant uh, issue, and that is we can't run from God. So there's a very significant passage, which is in uh, the 139th Psalms, uh, number of Psalms, and it is verses uh, 7 through 10, and, and we want to read that. So Psalms 1, uh, 139 uh, verses 7 through 10. Because uh, Jonah must have felt that um, God was uh, like man. That uh, we could go to certain places and hide. And uh, the normal, natural man sometimes can't find us if we go to distant lands. Uh, uh, we become obscured and, and we can't be located. But but God sees all and knows all and is everywhere at the same time. So the 139th number of Psalms says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. So we can't run anywhere. You know, we don't have hiding places that God doesn't know about. Uh, we can't be obscured by any large objects that cast a shadow on us. So no matter where we go or what we do, if we are commissioned with purpose by God, he will find us. And it would be to our benefit that we answer the charge rather than suffer the consequences. We hope that something in this lesson has been a blessing unto you. And as always, our prayer is that the continued blessings and the Spirit of God will always dwell and be with you at all times. God bless you and God keep you.